Okay, good morning. Welcome to lesson 22 of C53. Today's lesson is going to discuss elements of Bulletin 17C, which is a document that describes a way to do a flood frequency analysis um, for applications in the United States. And we'll actually look at the actual document a little bit. And then we're going to use our probability estimation modeling tools uh, to fit a long Pearson type 3. A very naive fit, uh, but, but you'll get the point from that. And then we'll actually apply the peak FQ software to an example uh, watershed. Um, and then look at the output and learn how to interpret that. So without any further stalling, um, let me go ahead and get to the right locations. Looks like I've already got some um, open tabs that are pointing to the right place. So today's lesson is flood frequency, Bolson 17C, lesson 22. And the index page is working, not working right, but it works. The main uh, focus is the Contents. This is a draft of Bulletin 17C, which I will regret clicking on right about now. Oh, I actually might download pretty quick. I already have an open copy on the presentation computer, but in a way we're testing the uh, web server's functionality. So this is um, the document. And we will scroll down. At some point we'll actually get to words. And this, uh, this part right here is somewhat important. Uh, the history of uh, <coughs> Bulletin 17C. Um, so in 1967, a group of folks that was called the Water Resources Council developed a methodology for doing flood frequency analysis. And that first one was Bulletin 15, and then there was Bulletin 17, and then 17B, uh, which was published in 1982. And we've been operating on Bulletin 17B since 1982. Uh, here's the uh, crux of it. If you read those words carefully, federal agencies are requested to use these guidelines in all planning. So that's a mandate. This is the method that federal agencies must use. The second sentence here, state and local organization, organizations are encouraged to use. Um, the methodology concerned with flood risk. Uh, this is this appears to be weakly worded, but again, if you parse the wording, since most flood risk engineering things are at some point in their lifetime federally funded, um, our state, local, and private kind of has to deal with the mandate. So that's why this is relevant for this class and other uh, hydrologic classes. So we'll return to the document in a little bit. We may return to it right now. In that reading list, there's a, uh, a few other things. And that copy of the document that I just showed you is actually a preprint. The official um, document is supposed to be obtained uh, from right here, uh, this this page right there. I don't think. Oh, actually, I'm, that's amazing. I didn't think that that was a functioning. It's not a functioning link. Wait, wait. Okay. Now, so let's get back to um, our class.
So I put together a usual presentation and I'm going to present it to you basically entirely through the web server. I thought that was a cool picture. I don't know how that has anything to do with flood frequency unless we're talking uh, floods of biblical proportion. Which Bulletin 17C is not um, the right tool to use. And a little bit of review. So we've uh, this is the workflow from probability estimation modeling. We went through this yesterday or the day before. Um, and right here, uh, there's a difference with the Bulletin 17C methodology. The probability model selection is no longer um, something that you have to decide. It's been selected for you. It's log Pearson type 3. Then the remainder of the workflow is the same. So the program that we'll use, uh, PKFQ, uh, literally just runs this workflow. Ranks, plotting positions. You can choose whether or not to plot the empirical cumulative distribution. It gets done. The probability model is dot, 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 log Pearson 3. The model's fitted by a variety of techniques. And then we would use the model to infer magnitudes. So there's no fundamental change from our prior methodology that was presented. And here's uh, from both in 17C. You're going to have to excuse me for a minute. I'm really congested right now, and I need to uh, get some Kleenex and do the disgusting thing of blowing my nose on the uh, recording. Okay, so fair warning to all, I'm about to blow my nose. Um, I'll try to do it outside of the video. I used to not care, but my, uh, my wife spent 20 plus years of marriage teaching me that that was disgusting. I was supposed to go and hide out when I blew my nose. Okay, so returning to the uh, topic. Um, this paragraph, if you will, is taken directly from Bulletin 17C. And um, I'll, I'll read some of it, but the part that's important is highlighted. Flood records describe a succession of natural events that do not fit any one specific known statistical distribution to make the problem of defining flood probabilities tractable it's convenient to select a reasonable mathematical distribution. They must have struggled to write that. Um, they should have just said, okay, we're going to use log Pearson type 3, and that's it. And we've used it since 67, and nobody's been able to unseat it. So that is the underlying distribution that's used in Bulletin 17C, and B, and A, and Bulletin 15, um, and some of the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers methods which are pretty much the same. So log Pearson type three, let's learn some more about the log Pearson type three. Again, from Bolton 17C, a little bit further in, uh, it tells us what a <laughs> log Pearson type three distribution is. It's, um, it says that the uh, peak flows Q sub i through Q sub n. Um, if we take their base 10 logarithms, that collection of base 10 logarithms associated with one of those particular peak flows is assumed to follow a Pearson type 3 distribution. And the probability density function is, is stated in equation 3 here. And this may be this is probably not unusual um, notation, but I'll, I'll describe it anyway. So x is the random variable. So the probability density function of random variable x, and the function is parameterized by tau, alpha, and beta. So that's what this vertical line means. f of x subject to values of tau, alpha, and beta being pre-specified. 
And here's the uh, distribution. X minus tau over beta to the alpha minus 1 power. E to the minus X minus tau over beta. All divided by the absolute value of beta divided by the gamma function of alpha. And then there's some more uh, words here and tells us how to evaluate the gamma function. The parameters tau, alpha, and beta are collectively called the location, shape, and scale parameters. Turns out that upon examination of that, a fairly subtle change, and we can discover that log Pearson type 3 is a three parameter gamma distribution. So if we make the following substitutions, we let lambda equal 1 over beta, n be identical to alpha, and create this new variable x hat, which is x minus tau. Um, that results in a classical gamma distribution, which we have already built in our script to deal with. So that's actually kind of good. And, oh, I didn't, um, didn't delete the slide. This was probably the slide I wanted to go. So here's a um, R script, and we're not gonna, I'm not even going to try to read this, but I want to point out a couple of important features. This is the same R script as yesterday, and we'll actually operate on the same data, Fairgrass Creep. We have to uh, install a library called E1071, and if um, I've not tried this on the um, Share Hydro yet, so we'll do that when we do the demonstration to install this particular library. All we need out of that library is a function that uh, calculates the skewness coefficient um, to save us from programming that calculation. If it can't be done, um, it's not a trivial program, but uh, the uh, skewness coefficient is equation 7. And I wouldn't want to be writing the for loop that has to uh, pass through all the data and then perform these calculations. Well, that doesn't look that hard, actually. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, so once we uh, have the setup, um, if we use classical method of moments, the values alpha, the estimates of alpha, beta, and tau based on values that are inferred from the sample set are given by equations 8, 9, and 10 in this slide. And here is the script to do all that. Um, then we'll go ahead and plot our model. I'm using the same 709,000 uh, range, which can be changed as necessary. And generating the um, density function and then uh, finally oh yeah this is a Pearson okay and then, and then finally plotting things out and here's what it looks like when we run that if you recall yesterday's um, models. Um, this by far is the, the best pass through the data that we've seen on this example data for Beargrass Creek. And if we guess a discharge of 5,178, um, that has an annual recurrence interval pretty close to 100. So that would be the 100 year or 1% chance um, peak discharge. We also can do log Pearson, and the only change for log Pearson is right here. 
um, when we actually evaluate the distribution function and we do the logs of the variables and then proceed accordingly. And there's a log 10 up in this upper part. Okay, so we're now going to go um, do the first bullet line. We're going to demonstrate fitting an R using our earlier tools, and then we will return to this uh, slide and proceed forward. Actually, I, I so I know Share Hydro 3, I got that working. Let's try Share Hydro 1. I'm intentionally not using the uh, developer web space. Okay, I'm guessing I don't need my swim model up. That was for something else. Okay, this has some uh, peak FQ files, but I want to uh, add a few to that. Okay, there we go. Um, open the web browser. And we're going to go get uh, the data from this particular lesson. And because I'm somewhat lazy today, I'm going to go directly. It's not right. at the web hosting site because um, when they upgraded their hardware last week they pretty much destroyed everything and when I called them on the phone basically I got tough it's too bad it's your problem so that's a good way to lose a customer and they will they have lost me but I'm paid up till next February so I will use their resources until I'm done with them. Okay, so that's there. That's important. And good. All right, first things first. Let's get the R scripts. scripts. Um, actually, I'll put it in Lesson 21 scripts because it's certainly related. And we don't need that yet. That's a, a different tool. So, good. Okay, so, and actually while we're here, let me go ahead and get the uh, Fairgrass Creek file. And this one I want to put into my PKSQ collection. So all the uh, data are downloaded. So 
So let's first launch. Um, go to our R script folder, and I'm going to open the um, Here's an example. Okay, so it needs this package. Uh, we're going to go ahead and let it try to install for us. Cut it out. And I hope the package is installed successfully. It just told us it didn't. This is a classic um, free software behavior. Is that it only works on the distributor's machines and not on the end users. Hydro One Linux library. Let's go ahead and try it. So let me uh, source the whole thing. Okay, it failed. <clears throat> Actually, the internet's on go slow mode right now. Do a full operating system install. Not what I want to do. Seven. Refuses to install. Well, that's going to be a problem because um, I don't want to have to calculate skew the old fashioned way.
Okay, um, in order to complete uh, the demonstration, let me do it on my local machine, which I know works. Interesting. It's all gone. <clears throat> Wait to go to that place. All right, here. So here's the same script that we just uh, downloaded. Only this time it should function because. Um, it actually installs packages on the local machine and on the remote host it's refusing to. So here's the um, um, paragraph trait. So we still have the Weibull plotting position function, no change there. Gamma density function, no change there. We import the library. Um, reading the data and some of this other stuff, no change. And now we compute the moments of mu hat, sigma hat, and gamma hat. And we need the library simply for this um, command called skewness. Now the alternative to that command would be to actually write R code to uh, process the equations literally to process that equation. Um, so it's a it's not a vital fix to get it to run on share hydro. We actually have to write a script to do that. Um, it is unfortunate that the uh, Share Hydro refuses to install packages. And that will generate an email for me to them on their free distributed code that doesn't work. Um, so we have alpha, beta, and tau. Um, those are the parameters of the log Pearson type 3 distribution as listed in bulletin 17C, and then the remainder is um, uh, what we're used to. So I'm gonna go ahead and source the entire file. What that's gonna do is run through everything, and it's possible it won't work because they may not have the data file in the right directory, but we do. And we look at that, not a bad fit, and we'll pick a discharge and just pick 5,000 cubic feet per second, which should be oh, like 97 percentile or a uh, 3 percent storm. And I, I can't do that with the my head. Anyway, that's an 83 year storm. So if we were to repeat that and go up to what, 5179 is the 100 year storm if a Pearson type 3 distribution is used. So, our next um, model we could choose would be to look at the log Pearson type 3. So, we'll open that. Let me kill off the Pearson example. So there's the log Pearson type 3. Nothing changes up top. The only change in log Pearson is we create this vector of logarithms. Mu hat is the mean of that vector. Sigma hat is the standard deviation of that vector. Skewness, uh, gamma hat is the skewness of that vector. Everything else uh, stays the same. And when we inverse transform, uh, we have a logarithm of discharges, which are up here, here in the model. 
And when I run this, the pictures, it's going to look like the picture didn't change. Um, or to me, it looks like it didn't change. Uh, I think it must have changed a little. Now, if we put the same... discharge in, we're going to get a different annual recurrence interval because we have a different underlying distribution. We're working on log, or log space and not arithmetic space. So the 5179 is a 64-year uh, recurrence interval. And so to produce, um, I'm just guessing a discharge. If we go up 300 cubic feet per second, uh, we get more. I'm going to go with that. Uh, so 59, 16 is about a 100 year storm. And with the um, uh, Pearsonian distribution only, it's 5180. So there's nearly 100 CFS more in log Pearson type 3, uh, which, which kind of makes sense to me from a policy standpoint. Because the federal guidelines say all federal agencies should use this, they're going to bias their methods to um, <coughs> higher discharges, which would lead to uh, over-design and fewer failures and expenditure of more money. Um, I, I kind of get that. The uh, Policy of the federal government historically has been somewhat risk adverse as compared to other um, entities. Certainly a private entity would prefer to use, in this particular example, probably the log, probably the Pearson type three, because it's 100 CFS lower um, value for the same estimated risk which would be a smaller structure, hence less money, and private in industry tends to be risk adverse, but they're even more financial expenditure adverse. All right, so the point of this was to illustrate that the Log Pearson Type 3 Bolton 17C, it's more elaborate than what we've just shown here, but it's doing the same thing. It's a probability estimation modeling uh, approach. And what we do is we use the observed data to produce three parameters in this case, and that produces this blue curve. And then we make um, interpolations from the blue curve. As a for instance, uh, here's the whole point of interpolation. If I were to ask you, what's the non-exceedance probability of 10,000 CFS according to the graphic. And you would look at that and it's like, well, it's one. So it's, it's extremely rare. It's essentially zero. Um, because with the empirical information that's plotted, we really don't have a way to extrapolate up here. And that's the whole point of doing the function. But if I put 10,000, I can certainly inverse compute its um, estimated probability. And so a 10,000 CFS represents a 599 year event. So once every 600 years. And I believe in the nuclear power industry, they do thousand year risk. So couldn't make a guess. So if we were somehow associated with um, high consequence failure and we're required to estimate the thousand year discharge, we'd estimate it in the 12,000 CFS range for these data. There's no way you could do that from just the picture. All right. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> gets us here and here.
So I <clears throat> would have preferred this demonstration to have worked on the online tool, um, but so be it. Um, Bulletin 17C itself uh, extends uh, for some other meaningful estimators, and it does something I didn't do in the R script, which is to generate um, error bands for the estimates. There's extensive provisions for missing intervals. In our data set, every year of record was available. So from 1940-something to 1972 in those um, <clears throat> example data. But in real data, we have gauges where they're operated for 10 years, and then there's a 15-year break, usually because of funding, and then they're recommissioned and operated for 30 years. And so we need a, uh, a technique for that 10 years of missing. Um, it's not statistically correct to do the obvious, which is just take that 10 years, append it with the 30, call your total record length 40 years, um, and proceed accordingly. Now that would generate an estimate, um, but you'd be criticized. So they've provided ways of handling the missing intervals. Uh, they have provisions for low outliers, which on some years, if the discharge is too low to um, be explained by the log Pearson type three, those outliers can be excluded from the analysis. And they're not thrown away. They're simply excluded, and there's a um, notation made uh, the effective record length is reduced in that point, and then there's a way to replace those uh, missing low outliers in the data series so as not to create a missing interval. Uh, there's a similar set of provisions for high outliers, um, and a high outliers reasonably challenging to wrap your brain around since the whole point of this is extreme behavior. However, uh, we could have 30 years of data that kind of plots smoothly in its frequency space, and there may be one or two observations that are so far different from the remaining 32 that they would dramatically affect the analysis. And those are called high outliers, and there are provisions for excluding those as is without creating a missing interval and replacing them with different kinds of estimates to uh, produce the analysis. Um, we could read the document um, for all that. And here's the, uh, the draft right there. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through it fast on purpose. So here's an example of um, missing intervals. Um, pretty, actually, that's a pretty drawing. Um, that's for doing paleo staging uh, data to try to extend the record length. And there's um, something called perception threat thresholds. And so, so there's a quite a bit of um, capabilities in this methodology. Fortunately, it's all been encoded into a computer program called PeakFQ 7.3. And what it will allow us to do is use observational data and generate, try to get the picture of uh, flood frequency curves. I think there's pictures coming up. Wait for it. Wait for it. Um, so there's quite a bit of um, uh, graphs in the appendix on how to use the uh, tool from a statistician's point of view. Um, and it 
goes through the expected moments algorithm, which was not used in the R script example. You can see that it's a little bit more elaborate than what we did there. This should look familiar. That's just a binomial counting um, tool and, and so forth. I thought there were more pictures here. So there's kind of what we, we started with, something like that, and it um, then produces a uh, estimate. Let's just go look at the software. So the software is called PeakFQ. Yes, I see you. You're making a video right now, guy. Can you wait a few minutes? So the program um, we want to use is uh, peak FQ. So we go to the launcher, right click, execute, and wait. Okay, so this is the uh, same interface as we saw yesterday. And now we're going to open a file. And the file I'm going to open is, okay, it's on my, my computer, C drive, home. This is Hydro, Hydro One. Do it again. Desktop, PKFQ files. Open, I should get an error message. There we go. So um, this status monitor error message can be ignored. And um, we've loaded everything in, and there's a bunch of tabs here. And we have a choice of using expected moments algorithm, both in 17B algorithm, or I guess skipping the global analysis. Uh, for the time being, we'll use expected moments. And in the uh, map skew, we want to choose no. And in the option, we're going to want to use ch station. So that's going to use just the data in our input file. If we go take a look at the input file in the input view tab, um, the uh, program uh, puts uh, perception ranges up there in the yellow bar. There's a default set, which is between zero and positive infinity. And then it uh, produces a rep representative plot of the data series. And in this case, uh, the representative plot um, shows no missing intervals. If there were missing intervals, there would be vertical lines where those intervals are. Our next step will be, we can save the uh, graph if we want. I'm going to go ahead and save it as a portable network graphic. And then in output options, uh, we choose what we want to put out. So again, portable network graphics. Uh, there is a standard output file as extension.prt that has the added bonus feature that it's unreadable on the remote server 
using the um, mouse pad text editor, yet it is an ASCII file. Go figure. Uh, we'll throw some additional um, text output for an export file, which I think we're we'll actually going to take a look at and the empirical frequency curve table. Okay. And it's going to save it all to the right place. So at this point, we're ready to uh, run the model. I've been running it from the input view tab. PeakFQ has a special bonus feature uh, in that it, it does a lot of weird stuff with files. And we found that it seems to run best when you run it from the input view. Hopefully I actually got that pressed because I have a little beast that just laid on the keyboard. Come on, I'll let you out. Oh, little beast went ahead and put in some input data. Oh, he broke it. Good job, little beast. We'll force it to close and just redo it. Force it to close and just redo it. Oh, it looks like we got control back. As you can see, it's now completely uh, damaged. get one of these terminal windows to work. Well, we just lost control of the remote server. I can get this fixed. Just got to get the right PID. Seven nine seven eight nine. Okay. Two, two, six, seven, eight. Is 
one down. Nine seven eight nine. Six three. Awful lot of work to uh, kill a program, but that's the nature of free software, especially if it was written by the federal government. I didn't want that. My bad. Back in control. Let's take a look at the uh, output. And there is the uh, Beargrass Creek output. This is on a logarithmic scale in discharge, which was the same as our R script, but it's on a probability scale, which um, I don't have a convenient way to do that in R. So. The R just goes from uh, 0 to 1, and this is going from 1 to 0. Uh, same way, they're just the ones complement of each other. The um, uh, 
1% chance estimate in this case is Ten thousand, nine thousand, eight thousand, some somewhere around uh, six thousand, which is not far from our estimate, which I think was fifty nine seventy for a one hundred year. So it's essentially doing the same thing. Okay, and we've instructed this to produce some output. If we want to look at the um, PRT file, the easiest way to do that is from within the software itself. And it um, gives us uh, some diagnostic mess messages. Since we um, told it to ignore any map readings, uh, that's fine, especially because we didn't give it useful location information. So the peak FQ normally has to have a latitude and longitude of where the station is to run correctly. And as we're scrolling down, The 1% uh, chance uh, that peak FQ estimated is 6,080, uh, which is different than we'll get with R because it's using a different numerical value for skewness. Um, it computes it in a different fashion. Some more notations for us. Regurgitates the input. Um, Again, more uh, input information. And then the data ranked from large to small. And then the expected moments analysis uh, representation. And that's uh, the typical um, data output. Now we'll go ahead and look at the, I want to look at the empirical. So what we could do here is we could look at the, this this third column is the EMA um, estimate, and we could compare that to our R script estimate for the same flow values uh, and compare the two results. They won't be identical, but they'll be close. And that's literally all. I think the export file is my personal favorite because it will give us the, the 100 years, the 1% chance. It's the third one from the right, so 6,080. Um, 250 is 75.54, and 500 is 99.67. Those are going to be pretty close to our R script. Um, and while for just making plots, the R script is probably easier to use, um, this is the uh, expected industry standard. So let's go look at a, another station that I happen to have loaded here. Oh, I won't even remember the path. What a piece of junk. Uh, 
So these are um, stations located in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Louisiana. I'm going to get over here. 0800 should be somewhere in Texas. And we'll just pick one arbitrarily. And it has PKF format. Open it. You know the error message? We'll look at the contents of it. I'm not sure if this has uh, missing intervals. It has some goofy numbers in it, so that's good. And with any luck, it's uh, rendering. Um, we have um, something going on here at um, 1928, and we'll suggest some ways to um, work around it. It's got this negative number, so there's two ways to interpret that, that it's in 1928, that was the number that was stored as a way to identify they were unable to um, get the values. Or we can um, do an override. first um, and you have to make a comment Should uh, okay. I took care of one of them. Uh, this in 19, uh, 1930 is missing. So for 1930, um, somewhere between 2,000 and 52,000. I'm just going to make a number up. say it's 28,000 out. You don't want to be making numbers up willy-nilly like I just did, but I'm mostly demonstrating how to um, build the input and it's refusing to accept input. Yes, I know, but you need to take my input. You need to take the input. scientific uh, wild guess hit return and cool the uh, red lines are gone and you can see the color coding as we've replaced values actually let's bring this one up to Okay, so we've now made adjustments uh, to it, and <clears throat> we'll go ahead and set everything for output, portable network graphic, return to input view, run it.
And let's look at the output graphic. This graphic's a little different in that um, we have 42 peaks that are below the low outlier threshold. So these um, open values are identified as low outliers, and that's it. Looks like about 8,000 cubic feet per second. This horizontal line is the uh, low outlier threshold. And so that red curve that you see is fit just on the, uh, the teal values. And they don't have a good way to control the curvature caused by these low outliers. These two horizontal uh, vertical bars are the two um, values that uh, we entered in the override. And, and we did that to complete the uh, series. It needed to have a complete series to be able to do the analysis effectively. And if we look at the, is it the empirical or the export? I think it's the export. Um, this gives us the uh, exceedance, um, the values for the different uh, probabilities. So for the case of a 100 year, on this particular stream, it's uh, 142,700 cubic feet per second. So the Frio River at Concan, Texas, in um, what would be essentially a flood stage condition, really generates quite a bit of discharge. But that same Frio River, like today right now, its median flow is 8,000 cubic feet a second. So we have almost 15 times as much discharge at 100 year as we do at a, uh, at a two year event. And that uh, concludes, uh, I wanted to show one last thing. Uh, was the file structure. There was a point to doing this. Let's look at the um, here's what a um, bulletin 17b or 17c input file looks like. So it's um, essentially the same information as we had in our simple text file. So it has a year and it has a discharge and it actually expects the day of the year when that occurs. So I artificially just um, call them all 0101. And then every record has a station ID. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And a code that describes what the data are. And in the <coughs> example, in the Bulletin 17C um, document, and actually in the print document, which we can't um, open, although I can try renaming that. That's not a bad idea. Let me try that real quick. No, it doesn't have the right. Um, yeah, it doesn't have the right encoding. That's unfortunate. It is an ASCII file. We can read it um, from the terminal, but that's um,
I'm trying to find out what the three is. Oh, it's computer's trying to uh, fail again. Okay, so uh, interesting. The uh, discharge code I used was a, a three, I believe, which um, is not quite an appropriate code. So I must have done that for a particular reason. Oh, excuse me, that, that's a record type. Type 3 is a record code. Type 2 is a different kind of record code. And then discharge codes go, I think, in one of these later columns. Um, so some important things that matters is that the program has to have a latitude and longitude. And so I made one up. Um, area and elevation are required if it's using mapping. The data have to be there. Whether it uses it or not is up to you. So this is a reasonably um, tricky file structure to get working. But once you have it working, the analysis is quite easy, as we've seen. And that, I believe, concludes the introduction to Bulletin 17C and how it relates to probability estimation modeling, which is all it really is. And we've seen some examples of how to use it. It's the uh, industry standard. So the Corps of Engineers, the HEC, has a different tool that uh, does very similar work. So that concludes today's lesson. I'll get the video um, rendered and uploaded. I believe I have two more to upload, so I'm pretty much going to clobber my home internet in a few minutes. Tomorrow the topic's going to be flow duration curves, and mostly as a introduction to what they are and how to interpret them. Um, we won't necessarily have the tools in place to be able to build one. I'll see what I can dig up off the internet and see if I can um, make a data reduction that makes that feasible in the course of a one hour uh, lesson when the computer stuff's going to break because that's what it seems to like to do. So if there's um, a no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting, and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, the Moodle server is almost completely repaired, so there's a few of them where it's not, and you'll find those. And I'll, um, I'll have that repaired surely by tomorrow, since uh, we're closing in on the last few days of the course. So thank you for your attention, and I'll, I'll see you tomorrow um, if there's no questions. Okay, very good. Thank you for your patience and attention. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.